Hi there, I'm Dr. McFerrin with DM Explains. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the basics of creating a root locus plot. So what is root locus? Root locus is a graphical representation of closed loop pole locations as a system parameter is varied. So if I draw a relatively standard looking closed loop control system, let's say I've got an input R of S into a summer, I've got an error E of S, some control gain, which I'll say K is what that is, and then a plant G of S, and an output Y of S that feeds back through some measurement H of S, and it's negative feedback. Then the equivalent transfer function of this type of system is y of s over r of s. And this is equal to k g of s. That's my forward path over 1 plus k g of s h of s. If I change the value of k, it changes the roots of the characteristic equation. So changing k is going to impact the poles of my system. And so let's develop this graphical model of this by taking an example. So here's my first little example, example one. Let's suppose I've got g of s and it's equal to one over s, s plus four, and h of s is just one. Then my characteristic equation is just equal to one plus k g h equals to zero. Well, if I take this transfer function here and I multiply out the s over s plus 4, I'll end up with s, s plus 4 plus k times 1, which is equal to s squared plus 4s plus k. And if I set that equal to 0, it's my characteristic equation. So if I vary the value of k, I can find different roots. So if k, for example, is 0, then I know the roots are at 0 and negative 4. So let's draw a little pole 0 map here. Here's my real and my imaginary. And in red, we'll put the poles. So initially, when k is 0, I've got a pole located at negative 4 and another one at 0. Then if I increase k, let's say k is equal to 1. With k equal to 1, if I plug this in, I'll get 0.3 negative and negative 3.7. Those are my new poles. So that's what I'm denoting right here. If k increases still further to 4, what I find is that I've got roots of negative 2 and negative 2. So that's a double root right here at negative 2. If I keep going, let's say to five, what I find is that I get negative two plus or minus j1. Now I've got a complex value, it's located right here. And if I keep increasing, let's say eight, then I'll get negative two plus or minus j2, following along. And if I keep going even further, let's say to 20, then I get negative two plus or minus j4. So that's up here. And this trend will continue as I go to infinity. It would be negative two plus or minus j infinity. And so if I were to draw a line here, representing the connection of these poles, it looks like I have a path which the poles will follow as I increase k. And that is really what a root locus is. A root locus plot is designed to capture the movement of the closed loop poles as I increase a value of k or change another system parameter. So all of that is great, but what I really want to know is how can I create my own root locus? So there are a bunch of steps. Let's look at the first step. The first step is to write the characteristic equation. Right, so the characteristic equation 1 plus k 
g h equals to zero. We can sort of pull k out. This really looks like one plus k product of s plus all the zeros over the product of s plus the poles. And what we're in fact going to be doing is varying the value of k from zero to infinity and solve for the roots. When k equals to zero, the roots are at the open loop pole locations as if there were no feedback. And when k equals to infinity, the roots are in the final closed loop zero locations. The number of paths, which are called loci, not Loki, he was the bad guy in like the first Avengers movie, but the number of loci is equal to the number of open loop poles. That's the number of paths. The other thing to point out about these paths is that the loci are symmetric with respect to the real axis. So sort of step one is write the characteristic equations and then some basic backgrounds about what a root locus actually is. I'm gonna pause now for a brief break. The rest of this video is brought to you by the cold Baja blast that a group of students just drove to my house and gave me. Okay, rule number two says that loci on the real axis are always located to the left of an odd number of poles and zeros. So to give you some examples of this, I'll draw a couple little complex planes. Pointing out, of course, that I'm not actually going to be completed with my root locus at this point. I just need to give you enough information to work with. So let's draw one, two, three poles on this first example. And then I'll have one, two, three poles and a couple of zeros on this one. And then one, two, three, four poles over here. So in the first one, the upper left, any paths or loci on the real axis are always located to the left of an odd number of poles and zeros. So I start, I start from the right and I work my way over and the first time I encounter a pole is at roughly zero here. And then I start a path, I'm denoting it in orange. And that path continues up until I come into contact with another pole because that makes two poles, which is an even number. Then I keep going to the left and I have still two poles, two poles until I get to the third pole and then my path will resume. And so on the real axis, I have paths that are to the left of an odd number of poles and zeros. Let's go to the next one. I have one pole and I work my way left. Now I hit a complex conjugate pair of zeros. So now I've got one plus two, three total poles and zeros. So that's still odd. So I can keep going, keep going until I hit this pole. Now I'm at four, so there's no path. Then I keep proceeding until I hit this last one. And now I've got an odd number again. On this last example, there are two poles that are in complex conjugate. Don't look at my lines, they're not very good. But let's imagine they're in complex conjugate pairs. That means I've got two poles. So there's not an odd number. So I keep looking, keep looking. Moving my way left, I see that there are again two poles in complex conjugate pair. So there is no real axis path. Rule number three says that loci go from poles to zeros and they do so along asymptotes. Those asymptotes are centered at sigma a and they have angles phi a, which I hear is a delicious type of Greek yogurt.
sigma a is equal to the sum of the poles, specifically their, their values, minus the sum of the zeros, all over the number of poles minus the number of zeros. So NP stands for number of poles, and NZ stands for the number of zeros. So the shape of the asymptote and the angle is defined based on the value of NP minus NZ. If NP minus NZ is equal to one, then my asymptote looks like this. The asymptote is along the real axis. And so the if sigma A is my center, then phi A is 180 degrees. You always have to remember to check your asymptote. If NP minus NZ is equal to two, sigma A is the center, then the asymptote is a vertical line centered at sigma A, and the angle away from the real axis is 90 degrees. Next up, if MP minus NZ is three, what happens is that I get a Y-shaped asymptote centered at sigma A, that looks like this. The legs of the Y are pointing back towards the imaginary axis. So the angle away from the real axis is obviously 60 degrees, but the asymptotes themselves are separated by 120 degrees. The last case to mention is when NP minus NZ is equal to four. In this case, I have an X-shaped asymptote, all kinds of wild shapes for our asymptotes here, which has an angle away from the real axis of 45 degrees, so obviously between each line is 90 degrees. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to apply the rules, the first three rules we have learned so far to an example. Let's imagine I have a unity feedback system with K and G in series in the forward path. G of S is equal to one over S, S plus two, S plus four. And I want you to find the root locus with as much detail as you can at the moment. The first thing I'll do is I'll look at the characteristic equation. The characteristic equation is one plus K, one over S, S plus two, S plus four equals to zero. If I multiply that out, that gives me S cubed plus six S squared plus eight S plus K. But if I look at this fraction right here, which I've boxed in, I see that there are zero zeros and three poles. What that means is that NP minus NZ is equal to three. So I can use that to find out where my asymptote will be centered. Sigma A is equal to negative, so I'm summing up the pole locations, negative two minus four plus zero. And then I subtract the zero locations. There are no zero locations, so it's just zero. And then I divide by NP minus NZ, which is three. When I do this, I get negative two. So I know that my root locus will look like this. I've got an imaginary and a real axis. And I will start by writing the poles. There's one at zero, one at negative two, two, and then one at negative four. I also know that sigma A is located at two, and so what I'll do is I'll draw my asymptotes, and then I'll go in for the next part. The next part is that I know that any paths on the real axis are to the left 
of an odd number of poles or zeros. So my first pole is at zero. So I continue until I hit another pole. That's at negative two. Then there's nothing. Then I resume at negative four. Let's draw that all the way down to the left there. The next thing I know is that these paths are going to want to go from poles to zeros along asymptotes. I also know that the total number of paths, that means the number of places that or lines that will end up happening, has to be equal to the number of my poles. I know I'm going to have some place along this path between zero and negative two at which the paths will break out and follow the asymptotes. That's the amount of detail I am able to find right now, but I'm definitely going to want to use more detail if possible. So let's move on to the next rule. Rule number four allows me to find where do the paths cross the J omega or imaginary axis. There are two good ways to do this, but the best way is probably to use Ralph Hurwitz. So let's continue the example from last time where I have G times K is equal to K over S, S plus two, S plus four. And I found that the characteristic equation is S cubed plus six S squared plus eight S plus K equal to zero. So then I can use the Ralph Hurwitz. I've got S cubed, S squared, S to the first, S to the zeroth, and then I've got to construct this Ralph array. So I first start by taking the coefficient of S cubed, that's one, and then the coefficient of S to the first, which is eight, and then I have zero. Then I'll take the coefficient of S squared, that's six, and the coefficient of S to the zeroth, that's K, and then I will go ahead and solve from there. In order to get my next item, I've got six times eight, so that's 48, minus one times K, so minus K, all divided by the original value, that's six. The next item in this row is zero, and then the final item in the S to the zeroth row is going to be K using the same method. So I know that in order for the system to be stable, I need all of the values in the left-hand column to be all the same sign and non-zero. So that means that for stable, 48 minus K over six has to be greater than zero and K has to be greater than zero. So K is greater than zero and then I can solve this other one and it tells me that K has to be less than 48. So the range of stability is if K is between zero and 48. So I know that k is equal to 48 at the j omega axis crossover because that pushes the poles into the right half plane making the system unstable. So 48 equal to k makes the system unstable. Now to find the value of the roots at that point, I'm going to go back to the row that has k in it appearing for the first time, so s squared, and then I'll say, all right, well, 6s squared plus k equals to zero, and I know that k is going to be replaced with 48 to find the values at that point. So this makes s squared times six plus 48 equal to zero, and so s squared is equal to negative 48 over six, and so s is equal to plus or minus j square root of eight. So if I go back to my original drawing, I'll redraw it here for you. Look well, something like this, I had my poles here, negative four, negative two, and I had an asymptote centered at negative two, and it's a Y shape because NP minus NZ is equal to three. Then my final root locus looked like this. I had a path between zero and negative two and then another one resuming at negative four. And then I had a breakout here and I cross over 
this j omega axis going off towards infinity. But now I know the values there are equal to j square root of 8 and negative j square root of 8. That row up there is called the auxiliary polynomial. The next rule, because I still don't have all the details, in fact, I don't know at what point these two paths diverge from the real axis path. These are called break in or break out points. These are the locations where the loci crash into each other and split apart. See, actually what's happening is that I have one path which is leaving the pole at negative two and one path which is leaving the pole at zero. And at some critical point, they s come really close to smashing into each other and then they diverge and go opposite directions. So that's the points I'm looking for. And to find those points, it's the points where the derivative with respect to s of d of s over n of s are equal to zero. In other words, for the original characteristic equation, for the original characteristic equation for one plus k n of s over d of s. So I pull equals to zero. So I pull out the k and then I flip that fraction, take the derivative with respect to s and set it equal to zero. These are potential break in or out points. We're going to continue to apply this to the same example, example four. So if I imagine my characteristic equation of s cubed plus 6s squared plus 8s plus k equal to 0, which arises from 1 plus k, 1 over s, s plus 2, s plus 4 equal to 0, then what I'll do is I'll take the fraction over here on the right hand side, I'll flip it over, and so I've got s cubed plus 6s squared plus 8s on the top, divided by 1, and then I'll take the derivative with respect to s, which is equal to 3s squared plus 12s plus 8 equals to 0. And the values of s, which you can find from this, you can use the quadratic formula for it, s is equal to either negative 0 0.845 or negative 3.15. And then what I'll do is I'll look back at my original drawing. So if I go back to my original drawing here and take a look at this break in or break out point, which I called out above, what I know is that that's the location. And so I compare that to my possible values of s from above. I see that this must be negative 0.845. So what I do is I figure out whether or not they're valid points on the locus and then I'll use that. Okay, let's do another much more full and rounded out example. Let's call this example number five. If g of s is equal to s plus one over s squared plus two s plus two, draw the root locus with as much detail as you can. Okay, so let's start with the characteristic equation. It's one plus k s plus one over s plus one minus j one s plus one plus j one equals to zero. For a moment, let's take a, a minute and see that the number of zeros is one and the number of poles is two, which means that the asymptote is just the real axis. Phi A is equal to 180 degrees. The next thing I wanna look at is the break in and break out points since that's what we just talked about. So that's D over DS, the derivative of d of s over n of s equal to zero, which is equal to the derivative with respect to s of s squared plus two s plus two over s plus one, and that's equal to zero. So if I go ahead and find this derivative, that's s plus one times 
the derivative of the top part, so 2s plus 2, minus the derivative of the bottom part, which is 1, times s squared plus 2s plus 2, divided by s plus 1 quantity squared, equal to 0. The result of this is s squared plus 2s is equal to 0, and so s is either equal to 0 or negative 2. So let's start by drawing the root locus, and if I have j omega axis crossovers or anything like that, we'll fill it in in a moment. So here's sigma and j omega, real and imaginary axes. Let's draw the poles. The poles are located at, I already factored them here, but it's negative 1 plus and minus j1. So if this is j1 and negative j1, and let's say this is negative 1 over here. Then I've got poles located up here and down here. Nice complex conjugate pair. And then I've got a 0, and that 0 is located at negative 1. So I've got a 0 here. Filling in details I have, I know that the real axis is the asymptote. I also know that any paths on the real axis have to be le to the left of an odd number of poles and zeros. That happens starting at negative one, and it never stops. There's nothing else which triggers my condition there. And then I look at the possible break in or break out points, and I look for a point on my path which will work. The only point that I can see on my path that will work is the point negative two. And so I've got these little poles, and so one pole will take a path which goes from the pole to the zero, and the other pole will take a path which, as it crashes into each other, will turn left and go off to negative infinity. Rule number six is about the angle of departure or arrival for a polar zero. I'm gonna give you the rule, but I'm gonna point out that it's really unlikely that you'll do this by hand. But basically, the angle of N of S over D of S is equal to 180 degrees, and it's equal to the angle of N of S minus the angle of D of S. That's basically what we'll do for now. We're not going to mess with that. I wouldn't expect you to do this by hand. Step number seven, or rule number seven, draw the root locus without breaking any rules. If you want to know K at any point, on the root locus, k is equal to the product of, so if I pick a point that is on the root locus, is the product of the distance to each pole over the product of the distance to each zero. If there are no finite zeros, then k is just the product of the distance to the poles. So in my next lecture, what I'll do is we'll practice this some more. We'll also show you how to use MATLAB to plot the root locus. And then finally, we'll show you how to make use of the root locus to design a control system to get specific types of transient response. All right, that's all for now. Thanks for watching. Baja Blast has a very interesting flavor. I imagine it would be what it would be like if you drank a battery. It also provides a similar level of energy. And then the other thing I know is that bananas. Oh, farts. Fart snacks. All right. I basically just destroyed my apple pen soul. Okay. Just another sip of Baja Blast.